I grew up in a church in which we would have identified ourselves as fundamentalists. I would have to say, in general, the particular church I grew up in, most of the time we got along pretty well with other people, um, though we certainly did have differences and we certainly did point those out. But I say that because fundamentalists at times uh, had the designation, the fighting fundamentalists. And uh, interestingly enough, some of those people who were part of broadly that fundamentalist movement took flack from other fundamentalists because while they laid out a case, they didn't find that it was valuable for them to, uh, shall we say, just yell at and demean and just treat with great severity and harshness those people that didn't see that way. In fact, um, before I came to this church, I had spoken in a church where I grew, uh, near where I, where I grew up, and they were talking to me about perhaps being their pastor, and somebody asked me a question about, you know, would you fellowship with this church in our town? And I'd say, well, I, I don't know. I know about the type of that church, but I would have to get to know the pastor and the people to decide, you know, is that, are the, would we be able to find, have good fellowship? I probably would answer that today. And I would say, well, if there are believers there, we can have fellowship to the degree that we share things in common. But that's something that's come with growth. That was a long time ago that I was asked that question. Uh, the person that asked it was very upset uh, with my answer. Didn't I, He objected and threw a couple of other things out, which I didn't even understand. One of the things that the person asked is, well, what do you think about secondary separation? And I was kind of like, and I tried to answer, and he goes, you don't understand what secondary separation is. And maybe you're listening to this and you're going, what is secondary separation? Well, that was the issue why he was asking about this other particular church, because he wanted to know that church, what they hold to, is pretty much okay from his perspective. But that church also fellowship with this church over here, and that church was off. So therefore, I don't fellowship with this church, because this church fellowships with this kind of church. Secondary fel separation. In other words, it's not only then that we avoided being associated with churches that just outright taught air, real air, but we we did disassociated from churches that, even though they taught truth, they sometimes shared fellowship with those churches that taught air. Oh, I didn't know what this was, and uh, it. Long story short, it it really shocked me, and it's something that I've thought about a lot over the years. In an assembly, in a church, the people that God has put there in the church as with the gift of pastor teacher, and in addition to that, they are recognized by the church and they serve in that capacity as an overseer, a bishop, the old uh, English word for this, which is not bishop in the way that we think of bishops in churches today. It was not that kind of a hierarchy, also known as elders. When churches look and see people with these qualifications. They choose these people to serve in these capacities. One of the things is that they ought to be people that are not fighters. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher, and um, I can be a fighter. There are times, in my opinion, as I look back, I think I have disqualified myself from our subject, getting along. And as we're surveying through the New Testament, we come to 1 Timothy 3, and I take this very personally because he's laying down the qualifications for a person that fills the office of overseer, according to the New American Standard. The Greek word behind that is episkopos, which if you butcher it, eventually it comes over into English as bishop. But it's just an overseer. It's all it is. This is the office that a person with the gift of pastor teacher may serve in if a church chooses to have them serve in that capacity. And when they're in that capacity, they also have to be an elder, meaning that they actually have demonstrated maturity. And so he's talking about, Timothy, here's some qualifications. If you're going to look for men that are serving in the church, you want to find people like this. And 
He tells them that he must be above reproach in regard to being a husband of one man, uh, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, uh, capable of teaching, or ex- one literally one that expresses teaching, not addicted to much wine. And then we come down to this word three, not pugnacious, not a striker, I think was the old English word that we had here. He's not a person that fights. We have other scriptures on this. I a number of years ago, I did a whole study on this uh, that I shared with our church, and I took it to a conference and presented a paper on this issue that this whole idea of arguing, verbally fighting, and fighting with other believers is really contrary to what Paul and Peter and John lay out. Now, Paul does say when he writes 2 Corinthians, you know what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do to remove the opportunity of those false apostles, that those unbelievers, those ministers of Satan that were trying to take over the church in Corinth and were trying to diminish Paul's ministry. And he's not doing it because he's looking out for himself. It's because he's looking out for those people, the Corinthians. But having said that, one of the things that those people said about Paul in that letter, and I don't think that they're wrong, as they said, Paul in person is very quiet. He's, he's a very mild person. In his letters, he sounds tough. Well, I think for Paul to go toe-to-toe in Athens with the philosophers there meant that Paul could hold his own and that he wasn't just a very mild-mannered person, if that was the case. But you know, as Paul was saved, he really didn't want to be that guy that yelled at and beat on people. He didn't want to be that anymore. In fact, he kind of seems embarrassed when he talks about that in his testimony in 1 Timothy chapter 1, when he talks about it in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, and when he, you see that in Philippians chapter 3 and he rehearses his history. Those are things that Paul didn't, he puts it out there to say, this is how horrible I was, and I don't want to rest on that kind of stuff anymore. Paul, I really believe when those false apostles said that about Paul in 2 Corinthians, or to the, to the Corinthians, I think they're probably right. Paul chose to be gentle. When he writes the Thessalonians, Paul says, I was with you like a nursing mother would be with her nursing child. I was gentle, Paul says. That was his nature. That's the way he wanted to deal with believers. Does that mean he couldn't stand his ground if he had to? Yes. But this has been important for me. When I first pastored here at the church, I went back and forth between just trying to be a good teacher and help people to every once in a while thinking, we need to, I need to pound the pulpit a little bit. I need to raise my voice. I need to yell. I need to get really kind of wound up once in a while. But the more I continued reading the Word of God and thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, there's no part of the fruit of the Spirit that says anger. Anger is part of the works of the flesh, not part of the fruit of the Spirit. Being yelling, do you know that that's listed? That's called railing. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's a quality. He says that some of you were those kinds of people, people that railed. We don't use the word rail anymore. People that yell insults and get really wound up and ah, like that. That's another quality of the flesh. It's an expression of anger and selfish ambition and strife. Paul's saying one of the qualities that we want to look for when we find a pastor is we don't need to have find a little soft-spoken, um, shall we say, um, just very, very mild, oh, whatever. No, you need a person that leads. But you can lead without having to be domineering, without having to be somebody that yells, without having to be somebody that blows their top all the time and gets angry. And I'm thankful the pastor I had when I was growing up, well, the one that I think influenced my life a lot when I was growing up, generally was not a person that was violent and yelled. But there were pastors, I think, that took pride that they were kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word hellfire and brimstone because we use that when we're talking about how you talk, how they talk to unsaved people. But just a pastor that rather than leading the sheep, shall we say, beat the sheep, whipped the sheep, drove the sheep, rather than leading the sheep by his example. So as a result of this, he says he must be 
not pugnacious, not a fighter, not a person that goes to fists, whether literally, and I don't have a problem with taking this literally, or also figuratively in terms of just they're, they've got a fighting personality. I don't want that to be something that characterizes the people that lead us, which then brings to the next word that's translated gentle. And this is a word, if you remember, we looked at this term. You, you wouldn't remember this because you, you probably don't know the Greek as I'm pointing it out here. But in Philippians chapter 4, he says, uh, talks about moderation in some of your Bibles or gentleness in, in uh, I think it's Philippians 4.3 or 4.4. 4. But it's that word meaning to let go of a goal. In other words, you as a pastor have all kinds of good goals for people, but sometimes you need to realize that that's your goal. It's maybe what you want, and it's not a bad thing, but if others aren't interested, you need to be able to be okay with that. Just because you thought of it doesn't mean the church has to do it that way. Now, if the Word of God says, this is what we do, then you need to say, hey, people, we need to do this. This is what God says. I don't think we need to yell at them and pound our Bibles like that, but we can say, God, people, look at this. This is what the Word of God says. In fact, on top of it, this word peaceable, the next word peaceable, then literally means not, not a warrior, not a fighter. Not a warrior, not a fighter. I had somebody tell me, uh, quite a long time ago, that a church will never be better than the pastor or the men or man person that's leading that church. They're never going to be better because that person is setting the example. They're setting the tenor for how that church operates. And if you bring in somebody like this that likes to fight, they're feisty, they get all wound up about stuff like this, and they don't know how to let go of things that, you know, well, it doesn't have to be that way. And they like to argue and they like to fight. And that person probably isn't really qualified to lead that church. And there's a good chance that they're going to draw that kind of crowd. They're going to draw the kind of crowd that likes to argue and fight. And they're going to turn your church into a, kind of a fighting, arguing crowd. And the problem with that is that's never the characteristic given of the church in the scriptures. You go to the end of chapter 2 and you look at the characteristics of the church and it said that they had favor with all men. They weren't fighting. It wasn't, it wasn't an argumentative bunch. They weren't yelling. They weren't standing on street corners preaching against every ill and every social thing like that. When you look at Paul going to the Antioch, uh, into the, the synagogue in the Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13, he doesn't go in there and charge them people, you guys, we Jews, we crucified Christ, and oh, 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 Rachel, like this, and you guys, all those Jews were so messed up. He, what does he say? Well, he says, this is who Jesus Christ was. This is what he did. I mean, yeah, our rulers, they should have known because they read about it every week, but they didn't recognize it and they didn't see it and they asked him to be crucified, but God raised him up. And salvation comes by those who believe that he died and rose again. They receive forgiveness of sins. Paul was very plain and very clear with the people, and the, peop and the people generally liked it. And the problem didn't rise until the next week in that city, but that's just another illustration of the fact that our leaders, while they need to be leaders, which means they need to know how to stand before the people and say, this is what the Word of God says, and this is how we should be, they also need, in their leading, to be people who, well, they're not fighters, and they're not selfish, and they're not putting forth their own agenda. They're actually saying, let's just keep looking at the Word of God, and let's just keep moving in the direction of people that are characterized like Christ was characterized with his kind of character. Wouldn't you like that in your church, with your leadership? I trust that's true. I hope trust that that's what you're pursuing. Hopefully you're not in the position where you're having to be looking for a pastor, but if you are, these are some things to take very seriously in the midst of the qualifications for somebody that would lead that church in that way. As always, I thank you for joining me and relate to who you are in Christ today so that you might have a good day.
in the Lord.